And you can see as I'm doing it this way, it really doesn't look that great. I'm avoiding one specific thing that I do constantly. And how is it different? I wonder if some of you guys can already say what it is. Hi guys, my name is Borodante and welcome back to Overpaint. And overpaying means I go through my Patreon page and grab all of the submissions you guys sent to me during last month, trying to fix them and giving you guys some advice. And today is gonna be the first new kind of overpaying episode where I literally work on one submission in this video. As I mentioned earlier, my overpaying tier now only takes maximum of three people per month. So I can make sure that I spend enough time on each submission and, you know, make the best of it. So let's start. And today's patient is Synchronicon. Hi, Synchronicon. Boro Dante, you master. Thanks for offering this overpaying service. It got me into 2D art. Nothing else ever could. Interesting. <laughs> I ditched software development of about 20 years in favor of catching up on creative skills and want to present this Dentator Elder, a Chimera Centaur, to your overpain. Yeah, well, the picture is quite something, isn't it, guys? <laughs> it's like um, some kind of tribal Silent Hill monster, like a boss. I actually really like the design. The only thing is it's visualized a bit too flat and kind of simplified, but it's not the simplified design. The design can actually look really awesome. I think we just need to bring in some three-dimensional aspect to it and, you know, maybe give it more depth or something. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this can be really transformed. I've only been at this 2D stuff for about eight months and use entirely too many tricks from old video game texturing knowledge to fake a higher skill level. I work at 4K but view at 1080p. All this barely works in most cases and I can no longer see the problems in my own art. I'm reaching out for any advice or changes you might come up with. Please understand, in software land, criticism is a tough 24-7 activity that never stops. Do whatever you can with this crazy thing and I'll be grateful. You got it, Synchronicon. The character was made from scratch with three brushes, a softened flare, a hollowed out circle, and a smudging knife shaped like the letter Y. Interesting. Interesting you thought it was important to mention. You truly think like a texture artist. The trees are a combination of my own from scratch smudges and one generated by Photoshop, roughly 50-50. Okay, everything is ultra sharp in there. The farthest part of the background, mainly colors, also some faded trees, were filled in with ideas based on ML generation. I couldn't quite see what a red sky with fireballs would look like and stamped sampled my way to victory on the last mile. The middle foreground was textured with scattered lines plus scattered dots and then smoothed with a low strength square smudge. You lost me a while ago, Synchronica. <laughs> Looking forward to whatever you can advise whenever you can get to it. Have a good one. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm on schedule. We are still in the September month. <laughs> All right, let's start. Right after this really awesome message from Wing Fox, huge service where artists share their courses about digital art, and they recently contacted me to assemble my own little bundle right here. So you can see there's six courses, and I selected them so they would form a solid package of knowledge, mostly, of course, for character creation, because that's what I do mostly. And even the final course about the cabinet in the fall, almost an environment kind of thing, it's a game scene design. This course is still approaching a piece of environment, kind of like a character as well, so I thought it was very interesting and gives a good transition into understanding the bigger picture of how you approach pretty much anything in art. And yeah, of course, I included the impasto painting a little girl course because of the beautiful brushwork and color abstraction that I adore 
and is kind of really close to the way I like approaching certain paintings. Level up your digital painting skills 2.0, an amazing sequel from Fishman and his awesome way of sharing his super incredibly impressive skill. Like this is definitely uh, one of the most powerful packages. Succubus Splash Art Course is really focused on good, strong, dynamic shapes and overall dynamic composition and pose. And finally, the two fundamental courses, painting realistic portraits, the most important part of the body, as well as drawing the rest of the body. So yeah, something to support the basic knowledge and go over the fundamentals. And yeah, the best part is that you can get this 30% extra discount for all of these courses. While also, if you've been watching this channel and if you bought them earlier, they are not included in the price so you can totally get the remaining courses with this 30% discount. If you guys are interested make sure to check out the affiliate link in the video description for this special Boro CG recommended courses bundle. Now back to overpaint. Now we need to establish first what exactly I'm seeing and how I understand it before we continue. This creature in the back it has like this pretty much almost a full woman body, but I can't say it's 100% like the connection between the upper torso and the legs, like this would be shaping up a normal person. It feels like these legs are more adapted to be like a bit of a shorter animal kind of legs, so they're not like purely making this female body here. Although I think it would probably make a bit of a better design if we would do that. Because right now she just kind of looks like a little bit of a short legs. They look a bit comical maybe. So I would make the legs longer generally on this design. But let's move on with what I can see. So there are four legs and uh, whatever is going on in the middle is covered with this uh, whatever it's called scales, right? And they're, they're the like night scales or something. Then in front we have three heads and they're all like different kind of monsters. One of them is kind of like a crocodile kind of thing. Another one is uh, iguana kind of like reptile stuff. And this one is more of a goat, but also a little bit of a dog. I'm not sure if generally I don't think they're supposed to be like pure animals. They're kind of more of a monsters. And last but not least, there is a massive tribal butt plug in the back. So that's what's shaping up the main anatomy here. Also, we can see the skull of a bird instead of a head on the on the woman in the back. And of course, her hands are replaced with, I'm guessing, like tentacles. And also we have a certain connection between the left hand and like the main head's neck. I would put it that way. So that's what I'm seeing. Also, they're standing in somewhat of a forest, but probably in a certain special place where there is an area for rituals or whatever. So it's a bold spot inside of a forest. Now let's start from the beginning and I want to position this character. What's the resolution by the way? It's all right, but I'll make it like 4K probably like this full 4K because I'm definitely going to be scaling down this creature because this kind of cropping is a no go. As you guys know me, I always fix that number one. So I highly doubt we'll be able to go through this picture with only like painting over. So even though this is over paint, I, I really want to like, if I feel like it needs rebuilding stuff, then I will be rebuilding. Now I can do that in this format. So I definitely feel like we need to change the angle. The angle needs to change a lot because the main problem of this picture at the moment is how flat everything is. It looks like a flag. So, right, the, the strips of grounds like this, and then this is like some kind of logo on top. It's also very flat and sideways. Everything's very sideways. So we need to break through that. And we're gonna do it together, Synchronicon. Uh, I wanna make sure I do this improvement of 
turning this flat character into a three-dimensional character in a way that you would really see more or less simple step-by-step -step way from, from the flat to the three-dimensional look. So let's try and see how that'll go. All right, so as you can see, yeah, I chose this brush and this is gonna be like this big difference between the way you approach the picture and the way I'm doing it. Uh, this is probably gonna be the only brush I'm using. Just some kind of mushy, introducing a certain, you know, amount of texture, certain amount of like showing the direction of the brush stroke, so there are certain bristles to it. It has certain repetition to it. You can see it's like not ideal. It has certain digital patterns showing through, like some kind of crumbly stuff on it. But it's not a problem at all because we will never have raw brush strokes of this size on this canvas when we're done with the picture. It's gonna be like maximum this kind of brush strokes that are also covered a little bit with something like generally for the strategy. Since you do work with like textures and such, if you apply the brushwork well enough, it won't be a problem at all. So it's gonna be this one brush because because just stop, people. Stop trying to paint with someone else's bits of pictures. You just put bits of colors on canvas. That's what you need your brush for, that's all, okay? Let's move on. It introduces more obstacles than help. There are, a, like, of course, there's a lot of awesome artists that utilize all kinds of textures and stuff uh, in their artwork, and they do it, like, really fast, like, uh, you can see certain speed paintings where, you know, they applied certain textures, then did something with them, and they're, like, amazing. Yeah, but that's not the way to start your painting journey. That's how you end it. <laughs> not to mention that it's not necessary at all. So uh, while I was talking about all that nonsense, uh, what I did was I was trying to turn this bottom strip of the bald spot in the forest into like a, an ellipsoid kind of shape to make it a three-dimensional round shape on the ground. So we now have this plane going on, and on it we can see this um, somewhat round shape. Now, next thing, I'll probably get rid of this super black shadow here. It's very strong, it's like burnt out. You almost don't understand what's going on, why is it so, you know, black. And finally, I wanna introduce, like, uh, when I'm circling away, right here into showing this uh, ellipsoid shape on the ground. I will cover it up a little bit with extra um, forest stuff. That's to introduce a certain depth. Like, whenever you show something, it shouldn't be like the closest thing to the camera. Because who said it was necessary, you know? There's supposed to be something in front as well, because things are in three dimensions. Something behind, something in front of the thing. So this definitely needs to happen. And I'm still, like, keeping the picture really, like, zoomed in on the character. You can see they're pretty much, like, uh, aside from a little bit of a margin here and here, the character takes up the whole height of the picture. Like, we're not working too much on the background. It's still just to support the character. And yeah, I'm generally, like, I'm trying to use a really big brush right now everywhere, just covering up all your hard labor. I'm gonna probably grab the like portions of the character from this original layer later because right now I'll probably completely cover it up because that's what we need to do. I need to work on the base. And I assume like you would have drawn a sketch before you started working with colors in here and everything. And this is the way I would recommend starting. Like at first you just drop the colors for the background because you know where everything will be if you have a sketch. So now we go from the bottom to the top or you can work in separate layers but still at first you work on the background layer. Why you do that? First of all because you know I still recommend working in one layer because colors will blend, you'll be able to blend things together much more naturally which is something that you're really far from at the moment considering how 
you know, pixel perfect all the edges of objects in your painting are. Like, look at this, you can't even imagine how you can make one brush stroke that would make a color of several branches at the same time. And I'm pretty much just turning it into this mess, like, this is how you approach things when they're all in one layer, all of one nature, it's all a mass of things. And that's something I'm trying to really get you guys to keep in mind lately that you have to send messages, not just show objects. And like the basic message of anything would be about grouping multiple objects, especially like huge, almost incomprehensible masses of objects like uh, trees in a forest, grouping them into one thing that makes sense, like I'm not painting 57 individual trees. No, I'm painting a mass of trees. So it needs to be approached as a mass. And for that, you never, you know, define things separately like that. The only thing we paint separately in here is the character from the background, because there is a message. There is a background and this is the character. It's not the background. It's a main thing. So in that separation, we have that message that this is a separate important thing that is the subject of thy painting. And right now I'm like working a little bit on how these spots would work better, you know? Oh, it's gonna be so different in everything. It's gonna be interesting to see. I'm, I'm like, you can see I'm trying to use uh, the original colors to keep things, you know, recognizable as much as they work best for me. As much as I can, it will be the same thing. Yeah, I'll try to make sure I don't speed up things a lot. So there will be like long painting parts in this video. So you guys would see how I work on the brushwork, how exactly I lay down each spot, because that's something I've been unintentionally removing from your attention by speeding things up a lot and that's not going to be the case anymore because I, I can see how this is really important to show and right now I'm like getting into slightly smaller brush size because I'm starting like to search not individual branches of trees but like you know at this spot there was a bunch of separate branches that grouped together into a more of a opaque cluster of branches and in here there was more of a bald spot that's why there's uh, you know more of that uh, flamey apocalypse sky that we can see through those and that's pretty much how you transition from these completely non-defined blobs of colors that yeah they work great together but how do you move on from that right well just make the brush a bit smaller and start thinking about not just, you know, this is a spot where there is no sky and there's the spot with the sky, but what's going on when we dive a bit smaller, you know? It's like, well, there's still branches. Some of them will let that skylight through, even though overall this is a more of a solid mass like this. And the biggest challenge here, which is gonna be a huge, huge challenge for everyone who's like new to this, is trying to introduce these new dividing details without turning everything into uniform again and sort of losing all the like, you know, that this is overall supposed to be dark and this is overall supposed to be brighter you still need to keep that while introducing smaller things that bring more complexity to the shape. Like your initial plan is not canceled just because you elaborate on it. So these are like uh, tall trees, right? So we're supposed to be seeing some of the longer trunks like this. And yeah, I'm trying, that's another little tip, like I was adding this trunk right here, right, tree trunk, or this one. And I wasn't like choosing the black color and semi-transparently painting on top. This already looks wrong. This is not the way I painted everything else. If there is a bright background, we grab the color close to that bright background, but a bit darker. That's like the overall flamey gradient, right, in this case. So it's first it's yellow, then it's orange, then it's red. 
you never paint red on orange because you lose the flame. Flame goes from yellow through orange to dark red. And when you paint in this fashion, like you're trying to see certain details in these big, bigger spots, you need to approach everything like it's out of focus. And when things are out of focus, you're kind of like splitting the light into its more and more precise things, like everything is blurry and you're trying to see more detailed things. Maybe eventually it will be darker, but on the edges there, you'll still have this stronger gradient that you can see how it's all working together now. It's like in this one mass of light. It's uh, kind of like this tree trunk is lit by this orange light from the back and everything. It's all, it all works together if you respect the transitions of colors. It's not just about the way things actually act, it's the way they appear when you blend everything together. I'm spending so much time describing all this because this is something that's absolutely absent in Synchronicon's art style here. And I feel like they would really benefit from adding this. The skill, not necessarily exactly the way I paint, but you gotta know how to do this. You, you, you have to learn how to combine things into one mass that would make sense together. Now I'll add a little bit more complexity here to make sure it doesn't look like a perfect simple circle. Because, you know, nature, things are supposed to be not as ideal and simple, but uh, always something, some, something happened everywhere. <laughs> so just add any of that. And you see, I'm looking for this design, like what's gonna look cool, how things would shape something interesting. I'm slightly overworking it right now because uh, I, of course, I'll introduce the character now and uh, it will definitely cover up a lot of stuff. But I just wanted to spend time a little bit on explaining how to go through super giant blobs of colors into something more defined. So there's definitely an impression of a lot of trees in the back in there. And Synchronicon worked a lot to show those trees, you know, to give the impression of a lot of trees while I worked super like chill and introducing just you know a little bit of stuff and it definitely feels like a lot denser a lot more detailed space than this even though we can see so many tree branches and tree trunks in here it feels very empty nonetheless like there's you just this is not the way you do it because there's no message of a mess and this is only the message of a mess. That's why it works this way. That's how you show a lot of things with a little actions. Okay, let's move on to the character. I'll probably cut this guy out or do I keep it as a reference? I'll probably do that. I'll just put it right here and I'll start a new layer just in case. But really, I wouldn't super need that or anything, but we'll see. Right now, I want to introduce like this is going to be more of a three quarters kind of angle, right? So the original is kind of like just like this kind of and I'm even being generous by showing this little depth in there because it's pretty much just just flat on the side. And instead of like this, I want to position things more like this, only not just like this it's important that it would be a little bit of this going on like we shouldn't see the top plane of this system like structure of the whole character this is just a box but it's important to see that like the top part of the character will be looking at it from the bottom and a lot of the times this is an important little detail because without that, if we would be looking at everything on the eye level or even from the top, that would make things look either casual or unimportant like or like small or it would just not bring any emotional value. It would feel like this is the kind of character that we would have a conversation with, which I think is really not the kind of character this is. We need to look at them from the bottom because they should look ominous, not ominous, intimidating. And let's just see. So 
you know what, I'm, I'm gonna do it as simple as I can. So I'll grab the basic color, like really dark one, because uh, the main, you know, the subject of the painting needs to be higher contrast, so the shadows will be pretty strong. So this is the spot that defines the female torso and the legs in the back. And in here we have this frontal plane. This is like the chest, that chest that we're not seeing at all in here. Between two legs there's something. This is the something. This is how I'm planning it. And one important thing, whenever you're rotating something, so if it was a long thing like this and super short on those sides, if we're showing this frontal plane in here, this side should get a lot shorter than whatever this was. So it's really important, like when you're rotating things, just make sure the side gets a lot shorter. Just something I'm keeping in mind. That's why the frontal plane in here is kind of really close to the back plane in a way. You know, it was pretty distant. And here this distance is getting shorter. Now I'll mark three heads right now. It's like just black silhouette. Why? Because this is a good base to start with, you know, I'll be adding lights to it a bit later. It doesn't matter. Right now it's a silhouette. The way everything else is kind of like a play of silhouettes. So this is the main head. Another one is gonna be like here and the third one is like here. So not everything needs to be like perfectly spread evenly and not overlapping at all. Overlapping is important because three-dimensional things overlap. It's a part of their nature and you need to show that. Something is in front of something. It's just the way things are. If you don't do that ever, things don't look too three-dimensional. Now I'm adding the frontal legs and while I'm doing that, since I defined this plane and I know legs are here, right now it's important not to just draw two <laughs> vertical sticks. You know, we're starting to think about the pose a little bit. Well, we should be thinking about it all the time, of course, in here. Right, I shouldn't be bending it backwards, right? These are actual human legs, so they're always bent forward. And yeah, uh, not to make it, you know, just stand perfectly vertical, like it's posing for an encyclopedia or something. I am naturally going for bending these frontal legs while the legs on the back will be going up. And this way we get to tilt this middle part. And that way the lady in the back will, will be taller with her legs being long and everything, as I mentioned before, that this is something I would wanna show. Then I want that stronger curve on the lower back in here. And it's gonna be something like that, I guess. So yeah, just to memorize, this hat is in here, this one's here, this one's here. Uh, this pale skull head is at the top. I'm keeping colors dull just to not have to think too much on them. You know, when colors are dark, they may as well be all wrong and whatever. <laughs> it doesn't matter, we can dominate over them when we add more brightness. Because that's the way human vision works and even digital cameras work. When there's not enough light, what do we see and what do cameras see is just a bunch of noise. So we don't really get the real information about color. Things get more flat and with more of a randomized color. And that's a good base to understand how color abstraction works as well. Because I, if I just grab green color in here and just add some green just everywhere, just darker, I can totally get away with it. You, you can't tell me this is wrong because this is too dark anyway. <laughs> some like violet, whatever, why not? I don't care. I'm crazy, ah, but I'm getting distracted. This is gonna make things more complicated. Uh, let's focus on just the design right now. I'm just trying to make sure you don't get overwhelmed. You know, this is really hard to build things in three dimensions while also thinking on the pose, while also thinking on, you know, colors and lighting. We're not thinking about lighting and colors right now. It's just making sure we defined the frontal plane here, the back plane there, and then we just think on the pose pretty much, nothing else. Now I'm gonna spend some time doing that. This will be probably the first actual time lapse in the video because I won't shut up. So let's do that.
So right now I'm trying to define the main little details of poses that I find important. So this is this main head and it has all these straps on it and they are connected to the hand of the rider. Apparently that's another important connection that I didn't mention in the beginning. That's actually that's what's up. She's kind of riding her own body. And so I'm trying to put together these limbs that make all that happen as well as I'm adding these hands, these weird arm things. And really important since I'm improvising, it's really important to make that not a default pose. Even though this is a complex design and you know, there are so many stuff going on already, the pose shouldn't be just default, like sticks. There are complex things, but what the emotion is, she's you know, all emotional because this is some kind of ritual or she's in agony, of course, why wouldn't she be? And that's why she's raising her shoulders a lot. And that's what I'm showing here. There's a very raised shoulders. And that's like she's being all like this. I'm like, I'm weird, yo. This is like main the main impression I can get out of her because, you know, her legs are pretty tight here and uh, we don't see her face. So she will be weird in her posture in the top half. So I'm doing that. Shoulders, they really feel like she is weird. She's being weird. She is feeling weird. Another thing I really want to mention, like I'm looking like between my version and your version, like seeing this one huge difference and it may be hard to understand what the difference is. It just in the way everything shows up, in the way everything looks. Why is it very different? In your case, you paint a certain color like the way you paint, you you paint like an object of a certain color, then you grab the color of the shadow, like maybe black even, and you sort of overlay, 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 then you grab the initial skin color again and overlay and overlay and grab the shadow color again and you add that detail like this. And you can see as I'm doing it this way, it really doesn't look that great. I really like I'm avoiding one specific thing that I do constantly to show things the way many people who submit pictures to Overpain do it. Like I can really see like it's all about this approach. And how is it different? I wonder if some of you guys can already say what it is. Like right now I'm shading down like semi-transparently because I want those, you know, softer shadows or something. Grabbing back the color of this top. And yeah, we're getting something like this. Now what I was avoiding is eye dropping, constantly grabbing new colors from the intersection of different colors. It needs to be just a part of your nature. That's something you should be do constantly. You should almost grab colors as frequently as you make brush strokes. So right now, if I wanna, like if I paint the bright side of the skin, and then I wanna add the dark color of the skin. Even if I make the semi-transparent stroke, I'll only like make it to then grab the in-between color. Like if I wanna have a shadow that's not super strong, I need to have that final color of the skin in the light shadow right here. 
this needs to be not the super dark color that I'll need to apply transparently like this. This never looks right. This looks super digital and wrong. This is not the way you paint. If you want to show a certain brightness of the surface at a certain spot, you need to first literally define that brightness here. You grab like, I'm going to make a solid, opaque brushstroke of this color and it won't be too dark. If that's true, then you have yourself a good brushstroke. You see, now I'm making these brushstrokes right here with this final color. It's an absolutely opaque brushstroke. And now we have this new color in here. This is a new color, new plane that defines that there is a message of this new color. There is not a single place in here where there would be a message of a new color. It's just semi-transparent flow of black brushstrokes on top of really bright brushstrokes. It all looks like it was just smoked, like the picture was smoked and not actually painted. So you grab the actual color of this particular darkness, brightness of the shadow and you paint with it. Then if you want to get more transition, grab the color in between. You can do it like this by, you know, finding the soft spot between the two and you paint with that, you know, only when you need to like fade it out into an actually soft place, like stretch a really big gradient, like in this case, because this is a curve, you know, in my case. Also, I'll add a little bit of the rib cage situation here, maybe like this. But you see, I'm grabbing the final colors and put them on the canvas. And they, again, they sort of bring the message. Okay, this was painted with this color of the light. And this was painted with the color of the shadow. And then I grab the color of a deeper shadow and I'll be painting with that. And it means it's a deeper shadow. It's not a, an accident. It's actually, you see right now, like there was all kinds of colors in here between light gray and black. But when I just grab the actual color of middle gray and I start painting with it, it looks absolutely different. Why is that? Because I actually mean this color right now. And it looks like there's this air, like there's this ambient lighting, like this is not just a mistake, some kind of semi-transparent black. No, this is this shadow that's not too dark. There's certain amount of light in it. This way I get to mean the darker yet present ambient lighting. In order to give that message, you need to actually choose these actual colors of different brightnesses, not relying on semi-transparent layering. Forget about that at all. Like make your brush as opaque as possible and paint with that. Paint until you manage to actually show a shape and you'll see how different it will be without semi-transparent layering that like this is so different. Literally, with your approach, I would be so bad at this. I wouldn't be able to paint. This is really before you do this, you won't be able to achieve actual improvement in the appearance of things because this is like in every single stroke you make. Yeah, so that's a huge thing that had to be said. So I'm trying to make the lighting kind of from the front a little bit. I don't want it to be actually from the top because that would give the feeling that there's like daylight and there's not really a daylight. The light, the strongest lights are closer to the horizon here. So I assume if we get to see the character with, uh, you know, not just color of the fire in the forest or something, we, we have to introduce another light that's coming somewhere from, like it's located on the ground, maybe light coming from, the, from us, from the viewer. So it shouldn't be from the top because that will look like daylight. So for that, I make sure that the top plane in here is darker than this thing that's looking at us in front. 
And this is like this complicated thing, uh, which is the values. It's not easy to do already. So that's that would be the next step of improving. See, right now, I kind of naturally just did that. So I grabbed the like base color for the scales in here and I painted the top plane very opaquely and then started adding the bottom plane with the same color, but semi-transparently. And this just looks wrong. I immediately like make it semi-transparent. Then I grab this resulting color and cover it up to actually paint with this final color of a darker shaded plane and then grabbing the color like the final color of the in-between curve also it shouldn't actually be that right since the top plane shouldn't be the brightest one as i mentioned just now because we don't want to have the daylight so it's going to be a little bit like this in-between plane is going to be the brightest one Also, yeah, I, I have like a reference at the bottom here on my second screen for a good shot on the female anatomy at a somewhat similar pose or something, you know, exposing all the ribs and muscles that I would find useful in this case. So yeah, nothing specific, but definitely use references for this kind of stuff, you know? And I should actually not forget to look at it at least sometimes. Yeah, another example, I'm adding these red glowing eyes and even here, even when you're adding the glow, you shouldn't just, you know, grab the red color and then like semi-transparently add the glow. Literally grab the resulting color between this red and this whatever background color. And that's how you get something really cool and painterly. Again, this feeling of, you know, defined certain actual colors it's a completely different world of technique you know it's so cool looking when you do that
a little reflection of the glowing eye in the metal, just to be a bit fancier. So yeah, I defined the main shapes of the scales in here and now I'm breaking them down into smaller patterns to show that texture that you use actual texture <laughs> to show. Also there's strong light from the flame, I'm gonna add that and introduce the flame as well. Okay, I started painting pretty much everything in the layer with the character. I'm gonna merge it down like this. So yeah, since I introduced the frontal lighting on the character, I should do that on the ground as well, because it's right next to the character. Anything else can be arguably, you know, too far away to react to this lighting, but the ground is right here, so it needs to have the same kind of lighting, otherwise it will look very detached. So some kind of unevennesses on the ground, some kind of details, stones, little bits of leaves and branches catching this light coming from the front as well. Now, this is probably looking weird, but that's something I want to experiment with. You know, this will give a little bit of a photorealistic look to the thing where if there's like a spotlight, think about like the headlights of a car lighting something up. You would see like if there's something right next to the car's lights, there will be like really ex overexposed objects in here. And that only works when the lighting is like from the camera. Let's say this guy is like slimy, because you gotta play with materials as well, you know?
So now I'm trying to shade down the ground and the back in there. Even though it was kind of supporting the silhouette, I'm really going all in with this headlights lighting in this case, even though no one asked for it. <laughs> That's one thing that I'm introducing, I guess. Uh, though generally I was trying to introduce minimum things. I generally just had to make a choice on which lighting would be actually the main lighting, you know? Because in the original, it's like everything is important, you know? This light is important. All the lights in the back are giving some kind of rim lighting, all, all of this going on, you know, and it's like from everywhere, but where is it really coming from? And which one would really make enough sense? Overall, it kind of feels like there's also lighting from the top, like the top of this skull is really bright, which is like skylight from the top, looking very casual and breaking the atmosphere, I feel, like it's not dark and scary enough for the situation, you know, I think it shouldn't be bright in there if we have such a bright contrast of the fire on top of that sky. That means sky shouldn't be bright. And so I made sure we actually go with its dark narrative. Like it's dark in here and I introduce a local light that would show us the real colors of objects, not the flame colors because otherwise everything would be orange. I I invented this light coming from the camera that is showing the actual colors of our character. Okay, it feels like very dense and dark, like jungle kind of forest. Well, jungle because I kind of went with very thick branches. Like, not branches, it looks like giant uh, bushes, which is something more tropical, I guess. But if we show more of the actual branches, it will turn into a normal forest. <laughs> Simple as that, because um, right now I'm on that level of detail where, you know, so much is defined except for actual details and literally like just changing this a little bit already, it's not looking tropical. <laughs> just uh, giving a little hint of certain things and that's it, it's enough. But yeah, overall, I, I think I'm pretty much done here. Uh, I think I showed everything I wanted to show. More detailing would uh, definitely make sense if it would be like my artwork, but I'll leave that to Synchronicon. Hopefully um, my advice is good enough to, uh, you know, give a way of improvement. Like a lot of things I did here that I haven't really talked too much about is something that I talk too much about all the time, like values. It's all values, values, values. How exactly to light things. That's the work with references, you know, look up photos of some something in the dark lit by car lights, you know, that kind of stuff, if you want this lighting anyway. But yeah, just a few moments defining precise values, like if the sheen is tilted downwards, it's gonna be darker, and this is like more towards us, that's why it's brighter. Defining all these differences in brightnesses, a according to the frontal lighting gives that effect and like that's all you really have to do. Now I, I wanna, I just, I really want to give this a try with making these guys in here super duper bright because that's actually how it should be like overexposed insane things when something's just getting in the way of the headlights is gonna be this bright now it looks a bit more reasonable in that regard also i'll add a little bit of cast shadows here from these very things that are causing the obstacles and all these little projected shadows like in here from this I don't know string or whatever it is it's casting a shadow onto the torso and this tentacle is casting a shadow over there all of that stuff really gives the good impression of what kind of lighting we actually have here also I can add something like that in here as well I think
So yeah, there we go. I think that'll be it. Of course, don't do it the way I did it, in terms of if it's such a complex character, make a sketch. I think I didn't do it half bad, That that's looking pretty okay, but definitely like the weakest part would probably be just the anatomy and the dynamics of overall things, you know, uh, they could be much more thought through, but for that you better have the plan, like you, you should sketch first and then solve everything else. I mean, if you can do it, do it this way, but don't be upset if you can't repeat it this way, the way I did it, uh, without a sketch. It's just that I definitely don't have time for sketching, and even in the future I won't be necessarily repainting the picture completely from scratch. I just, uh, I felt like I had something to say doing it this way, this time, you know? So yeah. Also, this guy had ears and horns, uh, let's add some of that. That would be an ear and horn, I, I don't know. Well, that's a horn. Now let's add the rim lighting from the fire. And that's where the other horn would be as well. So, some like that. A bunch of spikes on this guy, but that would pretty much be the way I did teeth or anything. It's, it's pretty basic here. But yeah, there we go. Tell me guys what you think. Uh, was it worth it? Did I manage to bring you guys some new thoughts on how to approach painting? I think I did touch quite a few interesting ideas here, especially about how to build things from just soft spots and how to transition from that to the actual more defined details as well as how to properly shade by actually painting with the color you actually mean instead of using semi-transparent strokes. So these are two things that I like if you want to memorize something from today's overpaint, I would like it to be that. Now if any of you guys want me to overpaint your picture like this or actually paint over it, <laughs> The link to my Patreon page is in the end of this video. You become my patron in the overpaint tier, submit the picture with the message, I read the message and overpaint the picture. But for now this is it, thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye! Man, this was one hell of a thing. <laughs> it's been a while since I just started and finished a super complex character in just one sitting like this. It was definitely fun.